give the, any of the other camps represented today other than Albany. We're, some of our members here um, are here today. Stuart um, Webster. Yeah, Stuart Webster. And, uh, um, he's commander of, of the, the brigade commander for the 9th Brigade, Ken Arvin. So we're glad to have him here today. He's doing a great job for us as, uh, command, as, as brigade commander of the 9th Brigade, Sons of Confederate Veterans. Uh, any ladies or members of particular UDC chapters or whatever here today? Um, okay, any, everybody here, you know, we're glad to have everybody. Everybody's a Southern Patriot, whether you're an SCV member or UDC lady or just a proud Southerner. Um, we're working to preserve our Southern Confederate history, heritage, and culture. Um, the um, op opening line from the, the movie Gone with the Wind there was a land of cavaliers and cotton fields. Here in this world, gallantry took its last bow. Here, here in this world uh, was the last to be seen of knights and their ladies fair. Read about, it only, read about it only in books. It is a civilization gone with the wind. But we're here today to try to keep that southern history, heritage, and culture going. Um, main points that... Uh, that you may not have heard of or some things that I'm going to maybe be talking about today. Uh, <clears throat> um, events leading up to Southern secession in 1860 and 61. The development of socialism in the North. Uh, there were socialist colonies forming in the 1820s, 30s and on up in the North and everything. And these people had some real liberal ideas that ladies and children were community property and stuff and of course most southerners wanted no part of this kind of thing. Uh, Karl Marx in 1848 uh, was an advocate of such things as that and of course total socialism. His, his uh, socialist revolution in Europe failed in 1848. Well in 1849 and 50 he sent about 2,000 European socialists, ma mainly Germans, to New York City. They joined with the American socialists, Horace Greeley, Charles Anderson, Dana, and formed the Republican Party. Now, when we talk about the Republican Party, the Republican Party from 1854 until 1877 was very, very similar to what the modern Democratic Party is today, socialist, atheist, uh, communist to a certain extent. But the platforms have switched over the years. Um, but uh, he, they joined... These European socialists joined with uh, Horace Greeley and Charles Anderson Daner to form the Republican Party in 1854. Uh, 487 of Karl Marx's articles were printed in the New York Tribune newspaper, including the Communist Manifesto. Um, and uh, one, one of the uh, things that they wanted to do was remove power from the states, states' rights, and move it to uh, centralize, a centralized government in Washington, D.C., but uh, Charles Anderson Dana had been to Europe before the war and actually met Karl Marx personally and so forth. Um, <clears throat> James, now, um, James. there was only one cause of the war. The South was invaded and we responded to Northern aggression. Northern secession. The tariff, the tariff tax, the Morrill tariff was coming down the line. It was going to be increased to 47 to 51 percent, and we would have not had the votes to stop it. The uh, population in the south and north originally was balanced, but all the immigration into the north, there were three times as many people, three times as many voters in the north by 1860, and uh, they were going to bleed, treat the south as an agricultural colony and bleed us dry with this 47, 51 percent right. tariff tax. And... Uh, the other factor was states' rights and centralization. They wanted to change America from, from the uh, constitutional federal republic uh, in the way it was formed. You had a, a, a federal government with limited powers, and, and uh, you had state sovereignty over most issues that the federal government was not given power over. But they wanted to change that. Cultural differences, most of the people in the South came from uh, Ireland, Scotland, uh, western parts of England like Wales and so forth. The pilgrims or the uh, Puritans in the north and all tended to be of eastern big city England or, da or Danish extraction, Viking extraction. So there were, there were cultural differences in America that had existed for 1,500 years before in Europe, before you know, we got to America. Um, 
the other thing was religious differences. I talked about uh, you know some of this uh, socialist uh, groups that were forming in the north and some of their extremely liberal ideas, uh, Unitarianism and so forth, Transcendentalism. There were a whole host of different isms in the north that the south wanted no part of. Control of western territories like Kansas and Nebraska. Uh, New England uh, outfitted um, John Brown and sent him out there and he murdered southerners, you know, that were not even slave owners. The south was made to feel very unwelcome in these new territories because New England wanted to control America and, you know, to keep control of all the, the new territories. Uh, the south's resources, our timber, coal, cotton, and so forth, they wanted that for pennies on the dollar. Uh, in reconstruction that we're fixing to move into, they got it. Uh, the slander of the South by northern newspapers. Uh, it was the North that was New England that was responsible for the development of slavery in America pretty much. Early on the slave traders were Portuguese, Spanish, English, Dutch, and French. When, when America got into it, it was first Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, New York. That's who had the slave ships that brought them to America, got rich off of it, and then they told us we were immoral for having them. But the, uh, the great English writer Charles Dickens pretty well summed it up in one sentence. The northern onslaught against southern slavery is a specious piece of humbug designed to mask their desire for the economic control of the, of the southern states. Um, aggression after the first seven st uh, states down here uh, seceded from the Union, Lincoln called it a rebellion, and uh, he asked for 75,000 troops to invade the South. Well, North Carolina and uh, Virginia and all were not going to allow him to march federal troops through their state to attack South Carolina. So uh, that's his aggr Lincoln's aggression is what caused the, uh, all the remainder of the other states and so forth. Um, slavery was an issue. Uh, it was already a, it was already a dying institution in the South. Uh, I have done a lot of research ch checking people's ancestry to join SCV. But between 1850 and 60, you find a lot of families that had freed slaves, and it was already taking place. It was just a matter of time before it would have died on its own. But the, uh, most, most Northerners had no interest in the welfare of black Southerners or whatever, but there were some radicals and fanatics in the North and all. Uh, and uh, 68 out of 117 Republicans signed a resolution advocating terrorism against the South. And of course, they, they outfitted the New Englanders, a group of them outfitted George, uh, out, outfitted Brown and uh, sent him, you know, down to attack Harper's Ferry and so forth to try to start a major slave rebellion like it. The Southerners were aware that that had happened in Haiti between 1791 and 1803 in which every, basically every white man, woman, and child on the island had been killed. Uh, down in Haiti at that period of time, they were marching with spears with dead white babies hanging off the points. And that's what they were threatening to do to our South and everything. So all those things caused us, you know, we've had enough of it. We want to separate, be our own government, and uh, separate ourselves from all these different activities. So that brought about secession after Lincoln was uh, elected. And now this is something I'm just to tell you, you probably, most of you probably never heard of, and that, you know, uh, but uh, who Lincoln really was, uh, we would have to have DNA to absolutely prove it, but there is overwhelming evidence by uh, uh, a Supreme Court judge from North Carolina, Judge Felix Alley. Uh, the, the, uh, Lincoln's mother was Nancy Hanks. Well, the question about who was his father, well, it, between... Uh, 1900 and 1910, a child support document was found in the courthouse in, in Clemson, South Carolina, and it was signed by Senator John C. Calhoun. He had came home as a new lawyer, uh, and he had business back and forth, and there was a, a tavern in Creightonville, and there was a young lady named Nancy Hanks that worked there. Well, the poor girl ended up was going to have a baby in her family, you know, like they did back then. The poor girl was being kicked out. Well, uh, John C. Calhoun paid Thomas uh, Lincoln $500 to take her to her uncle's house in Kentucky. Uh, the Hanks family said this is true. The Calhoun family said it's true. People that knew him at that period of time said it was true. Uh, this is not modern reconstruction of history. But uh, that, you know, the, the evidence is overwhelming that Lincoln was the illegitimate son of Senator John C. Calhoun. If you look at a picture of them, they're both tall and lanky. They both had malfan uh, mal disease or... Uh, or something 
like that that could have only been passed from father to son. So without DNA, the evidence is over, about as overwhelming as it can be, including a child support document signed paying $100 a year child support to Nancy Hanks. The Lincoln assassination, you know, we know John Wilkes Booth shot Lincoln. Uh, there's, there's overwhelming evidence on that, too, that the South has been wrongly blamed for that. Uh, that John Wilkes Booth and Judah P. Benjamin, our Confederate Secretary of Treasury, uh, were in contact with each other, and Lincoln's Secretary of War Stanton hated him. Uh, later on, after the Lincoln assassination, in later years, 18 pages that were missing out of the Lincoln assassination uh, report was found in the booth of, uh, of uh, the Secretary of War. Uh, uh, Stanton, and uh, they were they were like 70 different northern politicians, uh, industrialists, and so forth that were all supportive of the assassination of Lincoln. They they wanted it hip. They wanted him out of the way because what we're first going to talk about Reconstruction. Lincoln was going to be easier on the South and all in Reconstruction, rejoining the Union and so forth. And they wanted him out of the way to do what they ended up doing to us. Uh, the the, Getty, the Gettysburg Address, um, back, some of you may know about a man named H.L. Mencken. He was a famous uh, editorialist, a journalist, a newspaper editor, and so forth in Baltimore, Maryland. And he said that, the, he, he, this is what he said about the Gettysburg Address. Uh, it is poetry, not logic, beauty, not sense. Think of the argument in it. Put into the cold words of every day. The doctrine is simply this, that the Union soldiers who died at Gettysburg sacrificed their lives to the cause of self-determination, that government of the people, by the people, and for the people should not perish from the earth. It is difficult to imagine anything any more untrue. The Union soldiers in that battle fought against self-determination. It was the Confederates who fought for the right of their people to govern themselves. What was the practical effect of the Battle of Gettysburg? What else other than the destruction of the old sovereignty of the states, that is, the people of the states? The Confederates went into battle free. They came out with their freedom subject to the supervision and veto of the rest of the country. And for nearly 20 years, that veto was so effective that Southerners scarcely enjoyed more liberty in the political sense than so many convicts in the penitentiary. Um, it did not. It did not usher in a new birth of freedom, it did quite the opposite. It consolidated federal power, neutered the Ninth and Tenth Amendments to the uh, Bill of Rights, and gave birth to the fascist system and imperial presidency, presidency under which we now suffer. Mencken wrote this back in 1920. And as far as the, you know, the idea that, um, <coughs> that secession was illegal, uh, Salmon Chase, that was the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court in 1865 and in 1867, had this to say about it. Uh, <clears throat> Should you pers persist in your endeavor to bring to trial any of the former Confederate representatives of that government or any of its former military personnel charging them with treason against the United States government, that which you won on the battlefield will be lost in a court of law. And then again in 1867, he said, if you bring these leaders to trial, it will condemn the North, for by the Constitution, secession is not a rebellion. Jefferson Davis's capture was a mistake. His trial will be a greater one. We cannot convict him of treason. Okay, now we're gonna move into reconstruction. And it, it is entirely appropriate that Mr. Crisp and Miss Jenny built this monument to the people of the South that endured the horrors and atrocities of, of Reconstruction. Um, the Reconstruction Acts were passed in 1867 and 1868, three of them in 1867, one in 1868. Uh, they they uh, laid out the plan that of, of how the southern states were to be readmitted to the Union. Now, during the whole war, the North and Lincoln had claimed that that we were not out of the Union, that, that we were just in rebellion. Well, after, after Lincoln was out of the way, then they decided we were out of the Union and that we needed to be controlled by these Reconstruction Acts. So the South was divided into five military districts under martial law and governed by military governors. All males, regardless of race, were, were now able to participate in constitutional conventions that formed new governments in each state. 
Each new state constitution um, gave voting rights to all people regardless of race, all males regardless of race. States were required to ratify the 14th Amendment before they could be readmitted to the Union. Uh, they removed states' rights and transferred all rights and power to, of the, to the central government in Washington, D.C. The 9th and 10th Amendments, which are states' rights amendments and so forth, and the rights of the people were basically just voided by the 14th Amendment. Um, they, they, they were uh, different factors that took place in Reconstruction that hampered the South. Property confiscation and all. Um, they, you know, one of the one of the things in the Communist Manifesto and Sherman particularly, you know, was a believer in that that confiscating property and uh, so forth from Southern landowners. Um, but they they did that direct confiscation and then they uh, had they they ran the price of, they ran the taxes up so high that people couldn't pay their taxes. Um, they, uh, they had tax sales and they took the land away from southern landowners. You know, Francis Flagg Putney at Phoebe Putney Hospital, you know, named for his mother. Now, the hospital thing, the money he contributed was a good thing. It was for power and control. Uh, they disenfranchised people that had been Confederates, either Confeder anybody in the Confederate government, Confederate soldiers, everybody uh, were disenfranchised and could not vote. But of course, then they gave all the voting power to all the black males and so forth. So the, the Republicans during Reconstruction took control of all the, the southern state governments and so forth by uh, by banning uh, former Confederates from being able to vote. Uh, they, discriminatory federal budgets and so forth. Uh, they they I can't go into detail on all these things. We'd be here a week, but uh, the, you know the budgets and so forth like. Uh, uh, for for union veterans and so forth, um, all kind of different budgets and all all that money was kept spent in the north. Very little of it in the south, and the freight rates were set so high in the south that industry could not come here and compete and stuff. And it was not until after World War II, when the Roosevelt administration was kind of shamed into changing the uh, the freight rates by one of the Georgia governors, that the freight rates were more or less equalized. But before that. The carpetbaggers played us just as long as they could, and they kept the freight rates so high in the South that we couldn't, uh, industry couldn't come here and produce because they couldn't afford to ship it nowhere. Um, and um, <clears throat> banking regulations and all were extremely uh, biased in favor of the North. Uh, monopoly regulation was, was very lax. Uh, absentee ownership of land, as I mentioned, taking land away from Southern landowners. Uh, educating uh, illiterate former slaves and putting them in government offices, the state houses, the local courthouses, every position, you know, was, was filled with, with blacks, some of them which couldn't even read and write, totally, totally unqualified, you know, to be in, in a position like that. So this is what they did to us on that. <clears throat> Now, um, in Reconstruction, when you, when you read Reconstruction in your history books, they talk about two different things. The third part, a lot of you probably never, some of you probably never heard about it. They, they have totally left this out of the history books. They, they talk about carpetbaggers. They talk about the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. Well, the third thing that they totally leave out, uh, I had finished college, master's degree and everything. I had never heard of it until about 20 years ago, SCV during my studies, the Union League. How many of you have never heard of the Union League? Raise your hand. Well, a few of you, but most of you have heard about it. But you see, how many of you ever read about anything about the Union League in any history book you was reading when you, or studying when you was in school? Uh, it was left out. Oh, the Union League was Uncle Sam's terrorist organization. Uh, it, uh, what they did, these Yankee carpetbaggers came down. And I use the term Yankee now. Everybody understand that everybody that lives up north is not a Yankee. There's a lot of fine honorable northern people but a yankee that's different uh hillary, hillary clinton is a perfect example of a modern yankee arrogant uh, you know all of, all the whole long list of things but uh everybody that was up north was not it was not a yankee and is not a yankee so i wanted to make that clear but the uh the union league formed by the carpetbaggers all over the south they would have these elaborate ceremonies with music and fire and so forth they would indoctrinate former black slaves, you know, into the Union League, 
And if you had conservative blacks that didn't want to join or take part in this, they would whip them or sometimes they murdered them. And um, if, you, if you were a black and didn't vote Republican, they would kill you or whip you for that, the blacks doing that to their own people. Uh, but the, uh, the Yankee carpetbaggers in the Union League, Uncle Sam's terrorist organization, they were giving matches out. They were having them to burn uh, white people, Southerners, con former Confederates, houses, barns, shooting livestock, poisoning wells, violating women, committing murder. Uh, fanatical, uh, they were fanatical Republicans who wanted to exterminate every Southern man, woman, and child. Uh, Parson Brownlow was actually in Tennessee, but he was a scoundrel and a scalawag. Then he was one of the very worst of all, one of the most extremist of all. And, um, it, it, you know, the, you hear about the KKK um, forming. If there had never been a Union League doing all these atrocities, there would have never been a KKK. And, and when I talk about the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK, I'm not talking about the modern Klan or the, or the Klan that formed back in 1915. I'm talking about only the, what I, what I say now applies only to the original Klan 1867 to 1877. It was an honorable police and resistance organization. This Union League terrorism had gotten so bad that a man's wife or daughter dared not even go to town by herself or anything. It had gotten so bad. Um, the, so uh, it, it's what caused the um, formation of the Ku Klux Klan. There would have never been a KKK if they had not been a Union League committing all these atrocities. Um, Tennessee Reconstruction Governor Wh Parson William Brownlow. He he was a parson. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. there were several cases in history where some of these preachers and parsons, uh, uh, pastors and so forth, were some of the most evil people you could imagine. And what I'm just going to read you that Parson Brown is quoted as saying, and he was a newspaper editor. He didn't just say this stuff. He put it in print in the paper. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you will agree that he was probably about as hateful, fanatic, and uh, radical as, as a person could get. Um, he wanted to pass a law that any former Confederate could be shot on sight. No trial, no arrest, nothing. Just if you were a former co Confederate, that he, if this law was passed, you could, you could just go up and shoot a former Confederate, you know, nothing illegal about it or whatever. Well, when former Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest, you know, found out about this, uh, he let them know that he could raise 40,000 militia men as a, as a Southern Cavalry with the KKK to fight against that. Well, Parson Brownlow and his group decided they didn't want to have to go up against Cavalry with Nathan Bedford Forrest. It was, you know, he was, a, even Sherman said, you know, that he was a, the, the most unusual person produced during the whole war by either side, North or South. He was a, he was a Cavalry genius, you know. Uh, and then it, Forrest had told him that he could, all, in addition to 40,000 from Tennessee, he could raise 350,000 in the whole South. So, you know, the, the radicals then decided they better not form that militia group and just start shooting Confederates, you know, like that. But there were some cases where that happened, where they went to went to people's house. A young man had just got back from the Confederate Army. They'd take him out, shoot him in the woods and so forth like that. No trial, no nothing. <clears throat> Okay, this is what, what Parson Brownlow had to say. August the 10th, 1865, his editorial sh shows support for the Union. Um, and just listen to this. If we had the power, we would arm and uniform and federal um, habit, habit, hab habiliments, or he's meaning uniforms and so forth, all the fowls of the air, the fishes of the sea, every wolf, panther, catamount, and bear in the mountains of America, every tiger, elephant, and lion in Europe, every rattlesnake and crocodile in the swamps of Florida and South Georgia, every Negro in the Confeder Southern Confederacy, and every devil in hell, and turn them loose against the Confederacy. Nay, we would, we would poison the very air they breathe, the water they drink, and the food they eat. We would convert hell itself into one great torpedo and have it exploded under the very center of the Confederacy. A, we say put down the rebellion and force rebels to lay down their arms. And if doing so, we have to exterminate from God's green earth. <clears throat> and he, you know, and, and the, this, this, this stuff here, 
uh, the information I got about it, uh, there was enough of these scoundrels and scalawags and radical fanatics that he got great applause from saying what I just read. Another example of his speech was directed toward the Confederates published in 1864. Had we our wish, we would throw hell wide open and place all such beast-like men and officers on an inclined plane at an angle of 45 degrees, grease the plane with hogs large six inches thick with a wicket at the bottom and send them as one stream of traitors, robbers, and assassins into the hottest part of the internal regions of hell. Um, how do you get more radical fanatics than that? But that was what, you know, they were people that wanted to do this to the South. Uh, even when, even bef when the war, before the war ended, Sherman, you know, when he, before in the Atlanta campaign, he wrote to his wife and he said, you know, that it's not just the Confederate Army, you know, we're planning on extermination of men, women, and children. So, you know, you had radicals that, that were so extremist that they wanted to do these the kind of things to us. So after just reading that, what these kind of people wanted to do to us, I mean, that should explain to you why the Ku Klux Klan was necessary. And uh, several of these articles we passed out to you, you know, will give a lot more details about that. But, you know, the second Klan came into being starting in 1915. And of course, there's a modern Klan now, and I don't, I don't take up for any of that or get involved with it in any manner. Everything that I say about the Klan and being an honorable police and resistance organization only applies to that original Klan, 1867 to 1977. But most people, you know, when they hear the mention of the Klan, they've been, huh? yeah, about, um, they've been, they've been, uh, you know, so much indoctrination that everybody considers everything about the Klan, uh, you know, as being evil and that type of thing. But, uh, you know, the, the, the Klan protected the ladies of the South and if, if they from, from face worse than death. Um, but that, uh, <clears throat> That includes, you know, everything that I had to say about it today. Um, so that's all. Uh, we now we can uh, go go to the plantation house and enjoy a wonderful meal.